Hey, how you doing? So let's talk about education. Um, one of the problems we have in the, in the U.S. is that whether you pay for education or whether you receive it based on the governmental tax situation, it's no longer the case that you're probably going to get even an adequate education. One of the issues is that, let's take math and science. There's no way that you're, any school is going to be able to catch up to any of the billion dollar technology companies currently in existence. An easy example of that would be just the fact that Microsoft still can't come up with a way to compete with Google. And these are two multi-billion dollar companies. Uh, actually, Google at this point is a trillion dollar company. So if you're looking at a situation where math and science are going to create breakthroughs, it's probably gonna be on the scientific side which in a way that's aligned with data analysis. But that data, data analysis is in a position where it's, all, it's not going to be a situation where an individual is going to, be able, going to be able to create it, the next big thing, in his garage or anywhere else. It's going to be a situation where a billion dollar company competes with another billion dollar company in order to get maybe a government contract, a banking loan, and so on and then tries to establish a dominant marketing position, whether it's Google's search engine or Amazon's AWS, before anybody else can catch up. And so that's the math and science side. Now with science, like I said, you can be a little bit more optimistic, but the fact of the matter is that even with science, you're trying to, you know, you notice there hasn't been, there haven't been that many breakthroughs. Nobody's cured cancer. Uh, you know, the reason for, there's a reason for that. And, Primarily, the reason for that is that, you know, science tends to be trial and error. We're trying to cut off possibilities uh, through lab experiments. We're not necessarily, there's no way to create, a lot of scientific discoveries have been accidental. So that's the math and science side. In terms of history and, and all the other liberal arts, it, it doesn't matter if you're in a public school or a private school because even, in, even say economics, None of the textbooks ever figured out the concept of, of negative interest rates. There's nobody that can say, you know, you can pick up a textbook, unless it's something that's in the last five, to five years, then the, the models, all of them are completely outdated. So the minute you go to any school and pick up an economics textbook, all the models are wrong. So you're, you're literally paying, whether the government or a private school, to be fed garbage. And that's the so-called hard liberal arts. Now imagine what happens when you go into something like history. Well, history, if you go to a private school, whether it's you know, a non-denominational school um, or a religious school, no matter what, the human history is, is, um, is fortunately or unfortunately recorded, depending on how far back you go, either by theologians um, who spread the language, languages based on a alleged connection with God, so that you can see it as a marketing hook. I've got this special divine relationship, check it out. Or you can see it as something sincere. Um, but overall, you know, what you're looking at, if you go to a public school, is unfortunately, you know, another problem where the history is not going to be taught properly because the government has profited, at least in the U.S., from slavery, from all these things that are patently a moral that it doesn't necessarily want to you know hide but obviously doesn't want to speak up about it a very let me give you a couple of examples you know the fact that you know that people don't know that the southern united states was colonized by catholic spain and then anti-catholic france or just the fact that the united states was colonized you ask somebody they don't know that they don't can't figure out, I haven't quite made the connection between, you know, why we're in a city that has a Spanish name. They probably think it comes from Mexico. I know I was never told, you know, why we're living in a place that was, you know, has so many Spanish names. I was never told about the connection between the Protestant Catholic split that led to, I mean, first in 1848 or so, you had the Germans coming here before World War I and World War II. There were, you know, a lot of issues, primarily with consolidation of power. 
Then you fast forward and then you've got, you know, before 1848 and so, you've got another issue, right? Where you've got the French Revolution, you've got so many things. And if you try to line up the dates, you realize that no one's lined up the dates in a way that makes sense, in a way that proves that the Europeans exported their religious conflicts between the Protestants and Catholics here. And one, one easy, easy way to do that is to look at Santa Clara's, the founding of Santa Clara's mission church here and the date of the French Revolution. And you'll see that suddenly you just keep going up north and there's not as much development, not, not at least with Spanish names. So you see right away that some funding was cut off that prevented further exploration and claims to land. No one really tells you that. Um, so it's something you have to figure out on your own. And of course I don't tell you that because remember, if you're going to a Catholic school, why would they tell you that their, the foundation of their, of their success today is based on an immoral chattel slavery trade that you know, other religions didn't have, not to, that, not, not to that extent. For example, Islam banned slavery. That was one of the um, you know, sort of foundational principles. And that was around 600 AD. Uh, the Jewish religion, of course, you know, were slaves themselves. Uh, you've got the famous quote, Moses let my people go. I don't know much about Buddhism and Shintoism and, and Hinduism, but you know, you can see that you've got a problem if you want to teach history properly, because it starts to look like, number one, you've got excessive ownership, real estate ownership, because of essentially a foundation of immorality. Um, but it's not just that, it's also this idea that, you know, when you look at, say, even something as recent as 9-11, you ask somebody here, hey, do you know who funded Al-Qaeda in, in Afghanistan and why? They all have no idea. They won't know that the United States funded the Mujahideen and consequently Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan in order to collapse the Soviet Union. You ask somebody that, no idea. It's all public information. And of course, the problem with it, with admitting that deliberate attempt to collapse the Soviet Union by forcing it to overextend itself in Afghanistan, it worked. It was a successful strategy. But if you admit to that, then you're stuck telling people in your own country that you essentially funded Osama bin Laden and therefore your own demise. So you can't even say anything, can't teach people anything in school even on recent history, it's not something they're prepared to handle. The fact that the United States funded its own demise by thinking short term and by not creating the same situation for Japan and Germany as they did for, uh, you know, sorry, and by not creating the same situation post-war or post-funding in Afghanistan as they did in Germany and Japan. So you see a lot of problems, obviously. But you also see that the foundation of the United States is now fake news because it goes from the top all the way to the bottom. Because if the educational system is beyond repair, what's left? You've got fragmentation of information. And remember, even Microsoft can't get you the answers properly because Google is still far ahead in terms of searching for information. So if you have a whole society over a diverse society, over a large geographic area that doesn't really have anything in common except fake news and the inability to understand the truth. Where do you go from there? Is that something you can, is that something that you can possibly succeed at? And we're going to find out. Um, I mean, it's something that we're, you know, that, that's obviously something that, you know, it's, it's not as if it's going to be an unknown. But we do know that the country has $26 trillion in debt. So once again, there's, there's also this knowledge that the United States will never be able to pay off its debts. So what it's looking to do, and this goes back to negative interest rates, is simple, simply to get a cash flow that's sufficient to pay the creditors until it can roll over all the loans. So does that mean that the United States and local governments are going to be amenable to a society where the governments have massive debt, but not the people? 
what do you do with all these plans and all these deals that have been made? A lot of them are decade long deals that again, assume inflation, assume price appreciation. So these are all questions that are very difficult to understand. And the United States is having some serious problems in terms of trying to create a discussion around a foundation of truth while at the same time complaining about fake news from foreign countries. But once you look at it, you can see that it's not fake news from foreign countries, it's fake news from this country, from the teachers in this country, from the government in this country. And so when you're stuck in a position where your politicians and your leaders are themselves uh, not, and not necessarily in a position to understand the truth, then you've got to distract them somehow. And that's where you look at similarities between the Roman Empire and the United States. You've got UFC, you had, of course, the Colosseum in Rome, you've got uh, in, under the Roman Empire, you had persecution of, of minorities. Uh, all of that is being replicated here today. You have overextensions, about 20 to 40% of Italy at the time of the Roman Empire were slaves. Um, you've got, again, a real question mark as to whether or not the United States can survive without a continuation of wage suppression, which is modern day slavery. And if it can't, remember, it's already got $26 trillion in debt. It's got an annual deficit of a trillion dollars. Russia, the country that was, again, demolished because the United States funded Al Qaeda and the Mujahideen, now has a, as of 2019, had a surplus. So the countries that we beat are now doing better than we are. That's unmistakable. Nobody can argue with that, at least not financially. There's no argument to be made against what I just said, other than the fact that the United States has a lot of open you know, natural resources. It's still the world leader in, say, oil. It's trying to become the world leader in green energy. It's trying to catch up to China. So the idea is whether or not it can do all these things. Uh, of course, it has a lot of land. Uh, if you go to a place like, say, Japan, that is far more advanced, the fact of the matter is that Tokyo is probably about 25 years ahead of the United States, uh, but not necessarily a city that's maybe 50, well, maybe, a, you know, I wouldn't say Hokkaido is, is, would be on the same scale, obviously. So uh, the good news is that most of these countries that we've talked about have the same problems, which is overdevelopment in a small area, which then leads to overpopulation, but also price increases for houses and, and things you know, that we tend to assume are favorable because you know, they attract investment. And of course, immigration, which also attracts investment because it's another way to continue that cash flow to pay off the debt. And of course, the, if you're trying to defend the Roman Empire, what you would say is the people that showed up were not slaves, uh, even though they had no real rights unless they were citizens, the people that showed up were immigrants, is what you would say if you wanted to defend the, the Roman Empire. So there are a couple of ways all this can go, but the real question is if it's going, it, it requires a lot of stealth analysis, and the question is whether the United States is ready for it. Um, I'm not convinced either way. One of the reasons is that you know, it used to be that when a religion would splinter off from the Catholic Church, in other words, when Protestants protested the Catholic Church and then split off, you know, what happened was they were doing it in many ways based on a universal principle. So the Amish, the Mennonites, all those guys were anti-war. So they split off. They said, I don't, want any, I don't want any part of this. I don't want any part of Vietnam. Jehovah's Witnesses went even farther. They spun off the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, and again, all that was based on an anti-war principle. A lot, you know, those pictures of the Amish, that you notice they shaved their mustaches. That was an anti-war symbol. Shaving your mustache, now I don't know if it was because of Hitler, but you can ask the people here, why did the Mennonites and Amish shave their mustaches? It's because they were trying to show they were anti-war. So you can see legitimate reasons why Christianity splintered off before. But now you've got a situation where a lot of it is just based on wanting a tax exemption so you don't pay taxes. And, and the cities don't necessarily mind. 
because why not? You've got an empty piece of land, someone wants to develop it, why not give them a tax break? But again, it's not necessarily based, I mean, the principle of a tax exemption is not the same as the principle of anti being anti-war. So suddenly you have, because of the IRS, failure to enforce. Suddenly, instead of having something like the Amish, the Mennonites, the Seventh Days, you've got Scientology, or you've got something else. There's gonna be another one. And it's not quite the same thing, right? It's all designed to create a situation where it takes you farther away from a proper analysis of history. And the question is whether or not that further splintering is going to be, is going to make the retrieval of the truth accessible. In other words, is there a point of no return? We're going to find out. So that's all I have for now. Nice day in California. I'm sitting here over and I'll show you the park. There it is.